Heather Eaton, so nice to see you from Toronto, St. Paul's University in Ottawa. You've been such a major player in this work of, of thinking through what is a living earth community and your work on Thomas Berry, on ecofeminism, uh, now on conflict resolution and peace studies, etc. Um, so I just want to welcome you, first of all, to this uh, dialogue, this interview, and thank you for your long-term friendship. Uh, thank you, you as well, Mary Evelyn. Thank you to, as, to you as well. So let's go into your terrific paper for the conference, and I'm just going to actually read the very first line, because you're outlining the background for our thinking through living earth community, but we have to have a cosmological framework for that, right? And you've Agreed. been thinking this through for some time. Now, this first line, to know the universe, the earth, from time, space, physics, and biology, to evolution and planetary patterns, is a psychic spiritual drive. It is an outward quest to know where we are, an inner quest to know who we are, and an ongoing quest of why we are, why life is, and how to live. Now, those are the big questions, but I love this outward quest, inner quest, and ongoing quest. Can we just begin with your elaborating that a little bit, and then we can dive in a little bit more, and especially let's talk about Thomas Berry later. I think it's undeniable that in human history, there's been a deep quest to understand the parameters of space and time and to know where we are, understanding always that we are situated in bigger worlds than our personal worlds, our social worlds, but even the earth. So that this quest to understand cosmology is very old. But it's only recently that the understanding of the integration and coherence in what Thomas Berry and Teilhard de Chardin have called cosmogenesis, that's, it's a new understanding. And that links us to that this outer quest to understand the cosmos is also to understand ourselves, that we are a being in this living cosmos. We're not just observing it. We are animated from within by it. And that is a new insight. So the inner quest and the outer quest and who we are and where we are have a coherence that connects them together. And I think Thomas Berry, while he didn't use those words, that's what he was trying to say, as was Teilhard de Chardin. They were trying to find a framework and understanding that it's not, it's, it's to avoid the traps of com um, compartmentalizing our thinking, but also compartmentalizing what we understand about life itself. Yeah, and you've mentioned Teilhard, so before we talk about Thomas, um, give us a little bit of background of why Teilhard's important for this thinking, this cosmological thinking. Do you want me to say a bit about Teilhard's background? Sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit priest from France. He was also steeped in theology, in European theology, which is a really broad intellectual horizon but he was also a paleontologist. So he had an intense desire to understand history, but deep history. So what we would now call deep time. So he was trying to find a coherent framework that was a blend of the knowledges that he was um, acquiring. So that's a blend of science and philosophy and religion and spirituality. So he was one of the first in the 20th century to to actually say there's a coherence across time and space and matter and spirit and psyche, that there's, there has to be a coherence because he understood we emerged from these processes. So therefore, if we emerged from them, not only do we belong to them, we are of them. So he could see that his understanding of alpha to omega, what he would say, was this interconnection from the atomic level to consciousness, that they are connected. And that's a new insight. That's a really brilliant new insight that Thomas Berry carried forward, but we still haven't integrated. That we, it's not just that the earth is our home, it's that we are earth reflecting on itself. We are the living cosmos reflecting on itself. We are, um, we're not embedded in, we are of the same material, the same drive, the same focus. 
Yes, and maybe just a, a few more moments on this very distinctive perspective that you've uh, referred to, um, both in your paper, but just now, the psychic spiritual dimensions of matter. So that continuity uh, is throughout matter matters <laughs> because of this in interiority. Can, can you just help us um, dive a little deeper even into that idea? So from Teyana Chardin's perspective, he talked about the within of things and the without of things. So he said at the atomic level, we look at how atoms function and we can somewhat understand their dynamics, but then they complexify and they complexify and become more intense. So he ended up calling that the within of things, but there has to be a deep connection between them, but that's not habitual thinking. So he starts at the very basic level of materiality and he says there has to be some nascent spiritual psychic material interconnection it has to be because we all emerged from these processes so the only discourse that's bringing this up today is new materialism but i would say they're not they haven't gone as far as Teilhard de chardin went in seeing this coherence is throughout the living cosmos this coherence is within us, but it's within matter. And if we have a spiritual sensibility, as Thomas Berry says, it's because of the dynamics and the complexity and the developmental sequences of the cosmos. And that's a new insight. That's hard to get. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And so why does this matter? So we're, we're fascinated by Teilhard's thinking here, and he was revolutionary, and he wasn't right. appreciated by his times or his Jesuit order and so on. But why does this matter ecologically to see the within of things? Mm -hmm. Well, two things, the, many things, but one is there is new insights or awareness. There's a new awareness coming forth around the world that we belong to the earth community. So. That has many forms, that whatever we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. So from a very anthropocentric perspective, that's some understanding that's becoming clear. But in our language, we still talk about the environment and us, which shows a division. And the um, Thierry de Chardin, Thomas Berry, they're saying it's not, there's no environment and us, it's, it's belonging. It's being absolutely enmeshed in and a part of, with, of course, differentiations and many differences. Um, so when we're talking about the earth, we should be aware that um, we emerged from this earth and every part of this earth is needed to function and that the biosphere, while it is highly differentiated, it's also highly integrated. It's also highly coherent. And for people with a spiritual sensibility, what we do to the natural world is a scarring of a mode of divine presence, or it's a spiritual, it's like the sacred depths of nature that Ursula Goodenough would say that we are doing something more than damaging the environment. We are uh, damaging these very emergent, creative, complex processes of the living cosmos, but manifested in this biosphere with us. And I, to me, that deepens our awareness of what is going on to the natural world. It makes it more difficult, but it also makes it more, um, we become far more appreciative of the ingenuity and the complexity and the extraordinary um, beauty and um, diversity of the natural world that we belong to this. And it's, so there's a, an, an, a huge amplification of wonder. There's a huge amplification of energy and beauty animates us and um so there's a you know we can we can respond to the ecological crisis out of fear and out of anger and resistance and all of those things are important but to respond out of beauty and wonder and the elegance of the natural world i think that brings a depth both of energy and perspective and worldview so while it is more difficult it's also much more profound and i think more sustaining in the long term <laughs> okay. 
you edit out my phone call? Of course, of course we can edit it. No problem. That was beautiful. So let's pick up um, the last thought because uh, you mentioned Rachel Carson and Bachelard. And so yeah. let's have you say something about that and then uh, we'll go to Thomas. And uh, yeah, okay, we're doing, we're doing very well. So I'm gonna ask you the question about- Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and that was beautiful, Heather. So you've spoken about our awakening to this complexity and that the awe and wonder um, is an inspiration for action and, and protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm sphere and so on. So you've mentioned in your work in this paper, um, Rachel Carson in that regard, and also Gaston Bachelard. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about their sensibilities along these lines. So Rachel Carson, of course, was a scientist, but, and she wrote um, Silent Spring, and she wrote, you know, The Edge of the Sea. But if you read Rachel Carson carefully, you can see that she's absolutely in love with the earth. She's in love with the natural world. So she, what she brings to science is a, is a holistic or a much more complex response. So she will talk about beauty. She will talk about wonder. She also wrote about wonder as a scientist. And, and we are like these areas compartmentalized, but they really shouldn't be because we're responding out of the wholeness of our being. Are you still there? Yes. And then I'll carry on. Yeah say, that last, yeah, say that last sentence again, because something froze. Go ahead. Yeah, I saw that. Um, Rachel Carson was responding to the natural world out of her scientific understanding, but also out of her deep appreciation. And as a scientist, she wrote um, excellent publications on science and research, but she also wrote about wonder and beauty and aesthetics and the importance of just, on her book, The Edge of the Sea, of just sitting and understanding that life emerges from the sea. So what I appreciate about her is that this it's a scientific approach that blends. It blends aesthetics and science and ethics. And to me, that's it, it's a great deal more intelligent than compartmentalizing them. She also wrote that the more we appreciate the beauty of the natural world, the less taste we'll have for its destruction, which to me is very insightful. Gaston Bachelard also was this person with this intellectual, large intellectual perspective. So he was also a scientist, also a psychoanalyst, a poet, and he wrote about the, the fact that whatever we're experiencing in the world, we're experiencing within ourselves. So when we, when we speak about experiencing the immensity of the forest or of a vista, we are actually experiencing the forest within ourselves. So this is the exterior journey and the interior journey, or these dimensions, they're very connected. And I think, and Bachelard used this term, intimate immensities. So that what we experience the world within ourselves, and that is something we should be aware of and cultivate. Yes, exactly. And of course, as you know well, that's what we're trying to do with Journey of the Universe and, and yes. so on, um, and, and to celebrate that sensibility at every scale of the evolutionary epic story. So moving in that direction, um, we've been fortunate, you and I, and many others to have studied uh, with Thomas Berry, to have studied his works, um, yeah. to have listened to so many of his talks and so on. So how, um, how does Thomas Berry fit into this conversation on cosmology and ecology? I think, I think eventually we recognize that Thomas Berry was one of the most significant intellectuals of the 20th century. He, he was a man with, as you have said, with breadth and depth of understanding and knowledge and acumen beyond what most other people have, have had or have. And he, um, his understanding of diverse cultures, different spiritual depths and insights and what motivates um, what motivates humans to make claims about what is sacred, what is important, what is suffering, what is good. Um, he had this breadth that allowed him to see that what was happening to the ecological, what was happening to the natural world or what we call the ecological crisis now had deep roots in the human psyche, deep roots in, not in our psychic orientation, but in the worldviews that we have 
put together over many, over millennia. Um, we just, again, yeah. should I carry yeah. on? Yeah, go ahead. Just keep going about the worldviews. Okay. So Thomas Berry could have had an understanding that the ecological crisis is not just an exterior crisis. It's a deep under, it's a crisis of what humans, how humans understand ourselves, especially in the European Western worldviews, that we have understood ourselves uh, in a, not only incorrectly as being apart from nature, but extreme, with a very dangerous, destructive worldview. And that is an understanding of the ecological crisis has very deep roots in how we understand ourselves and how we understand the world and the earth. And so scientific knowledge isn't sufficient to just correct our, under, our worldview. We have to, this is why living cosmology is so important because it, it reorients ourselves at a deeply psychic level. And that's what Thomas Berry was trying to do with the new story, saying we, we have to go to these deep understandings of our basic presuppositions about the world, who we are, the earth, do we belong? And he, he did this and it still feels foreign to many people, but its intellectual breadth and depth is staggering and stunning. Yes, um, so the sense of, uh, of a need for a new story that changes our sensibilities across the board for education, for economics, for politics, for gender, for race, and so on, um, because partly, it seems clear, we're in the struggle for the unity that comes out of a evolutionary story, but also the diversity. And yes. respecting that diversity, um, both in the evolutionary ecological sense, but in the social sense, in the human the sense. Cultural sense, yes. Cultural sense, thank you. Um, so how can we calibrate this um, at a time when multiculturalism is so prevalent and rightly so, the inclusion of um, people especially in Western societies that have not been part of the democratic process fully and so on. So how can we calibrate, how does this story help us to see mm -hmm. unity and difference uh, that's needed right now? I think this is a point of tension that takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of pondering mm -hmm. to understand that this, the, what is being proposed as the new story does not erase cultural specificities it but it will challenge notions of human dominance over the natural world i think it does challenge that so if a culture is based in a story that promotes human dominance then the new story is challenging that but the the fact that humans evolved within an earth community is relatively indisputable it's not just another cultural story. It comes out of a, a different way of empirically understanding where we are. So the challenge is more to integrate it into culturally diverse communities, that people can integrate the, the reality that we belong. And in truth, the natural world and its crises, it's, it's affecting people's understanding. So we can do this from both sides. One is an education, such as the journey of the universe and all the projects that go with that to educate people and reorient them. But also when, you know, the it is the fact that the, if we, the more we damage the natural world, the more we damage our possibilities for living well. So that knowledge also impacts cultural differences. And so when that happens, so for example, if rivers are polluted um, they don't respect national boundaries and countries have to collaborate. So at both ends of education and also ecological disaster, it, it pushes cultures to collaborate across diversity, not erase diversities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, of course, I'd love to ask you about our two societies, Canadian and U.S. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe briefly, you know, comment on the notion that there's a mosaic um, in, in Canada, our multicultural kind of very messy melting, society. Melting pot. Thank you, exactly. Um, so just briefly, I'd love to have you comment on that. And then I want to go to the conflict resolution and peace studies that you're involved in. But how do you see these two images 
the mosaic and the, the melting pot in relation to what we're, we're discussing then? Well, I think they're images. I'm not sure they're actually, I mean, they say that these are the, these are the policies, the multicultural policies of both the United States and Canada, the United States being melting pot, Canada being mosaic. But really, it's hard to differentiate on the ground what those differences are. Some communities integrate better than others in this culturally diverse world. You know, both countries have a cultural diversity. I think, though, that cultural diversity or cultural conflict happens when there are strain. There's a strain, and so you can see in the United States, there's a, there's a tension right now around the women, the progressives, the political. And in Canada, we see cultural conflict with Indigenous people all the time. So the mosaic doesn't, it functions well when there's no challenges or tensions, but it doesn't, the cultural differences become more important when there are challenges and tensions. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, um, whether women can wear the hijab in Quebec is a point of cultural tension. Now, is that a critical issue? Well, for some communities, um, it's not an ecological issue. So it's really hard to know that how deep these cultural tensions actually go and what emerges when there's really serious conflicts. Right. Um, and I guess one of the things, of course, I want to link up, is, as you do so well, and that Thomas would say, this isn't just a beautiful story, this yeah. epic evolution, it's a functional cosmology. So yes. how does it help us ecologically and socially? How does it give us a different educational framework and a, and a political framework? So this new continuity, or at least integration of what the encyclical is calling integral ecology, which Thomas right. used to, of people and the planet and so on, um, I think that's part of where we're moving towards and environmental studies programs are saying, of course, we have to yeah. include justice and, and human issues and, and environmental justice in particular. So you've been very attentive to that throughout your, your career and your thinking. And now you're working more explicitly in, in peace and conflict resolution mm -hmm. studies. You've done a book in this area and you're setting up a, a master's program. So give us a feeling for... How does the, maybe this new story contribute to that? But wh why are you driven to do this right now? Which is a new program, um, Conflict Resolution and Peace Studies. And tell us about that. I think that the more people delve into what the new story is with an open mind and with really pursuing it, the more they can manage cultural diversity, the more they can manage conflicts, because they see that at the ultimate belonging to the biosphere is, is a greater membership than, than our individual cultures or families. It's a, it's a greater membership. So I see the new story and as something that can help people collaborate and cooperate, and they don't have to have cultural sameness. They can have a great deal of cultural differences and collaborate and cooperate. What I do see though, I see, and I see it in women's, in feminist studies and gender studies, that the preoccupation with social issues and the preoccupation with what I would call identity politics sometimes, and the preoccupation with cultural specificity um, overrides any understanding of the belonging to the natural world. So to me, the, the, it's not obvious in a simple way how social issues and ecological issues are connected, but of course they're very deeply connected. But there are, most of the people who care about what is happening to the planet and happening to social communities care about social justice. It's something they carry with them. They see inequities, they see poverty, they see you know, massive economic systems of inequity, bias, of structural violence, so these are operative in human communities, but, they're, but structural violence is also operative in human earth relations. That's also a form of structural violence. So the work, um, I do a lot of work with the ideas of, of structural violence because they're embedded in racism and they're embedded in any ethnocentrism, gender issues, but they also, it must be enlarged mm -hmm. to see the natural, to include the natural world. It, it, because that to me is it's the reversal of all of those in an integrated way and that's hard work it's hard work to get people to make that inner shift 
because you can't just learn it. You have to really get your reference points to shift. And, um, and I also see the rise of um, inter-intrastate violence. So nonviolence is also increasing all around the world. So just as an aside, there was a conference in Toronto last week, the nonviolent community joining with the animal liberation community. Mm. Now that's very interesting. Yes. So there, I think these alternative voices are trying to join together, like 350.org. How do you blend the issues? How do you bring them together? We don't all have to bring all the issues, but we do have to work together. So I think this language of crossing over social justice and ecology is very important. Those bridges are very, very important. Otherwise, yes. the communities remain split. Right. So strategically, they're important, as well as the reality they're important. Absolutely. So maybe we can just conclude on the notion that we all realize we don't have a sufficient ethics to deal with this, uh, these new human earth relations, um, this sense of unity and diversity, uh, mosaic and, and melting pot. Um, but it would seem, and you are a theologian, you're a person who's thought about these things for some time, it would seem as though new environmental ethics, new ethics of, of, of justice and the environment are emerging. And even in a book, um, Dan Scheid's book, cosmological ethics are right. emerging. So we're having ethics on the scale, cosmological ethics, earth ethics, new social and environmental ethics. Can you just comment on, on this? I think it's an exciting new direction. I think, I think we can't work with our work in the tight boundaries of the previous ethical traditions of the enlightenment. I think they're too narrow and they're too narrow for the complexity of the world. And from ecological ethics, we need ecological literacy to have ecological ethics. So we have to have much greater ecological literacy. But the, the, I think there's two things about cosmological ethics. So Thomas Berry always talked about uh, differentiation, subjectivity, interconnection, that the, 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 there are dynamics to life-giving processes that can be reflected upon from the perspective of ethics. So if the biosphere functions in an integrated, uh, deeply interconnected, differentiated way, then we have to develop ethics. Seeing it that way, we have to develop ethics that are far more comprehensive and that are life-affirming for a larger Earth community. So they have to be deeply inclusive to be real. But I'm also, I also reflect a lot on aesthetics. So what's the relationship between aesthetics and ethics? How does beauty inform ethics? And it's quite stunning how much beauty informs ethics historically. And I think that's what wonder, this whole language of wonder, that wonder informs people's ethics. And there's recent research coming out of different universities, neurological studies on how wonder actually changes people's capacity to tolerate difference, to tolerate diversity, to be more courageous, to be, to join with others. It's quite interesting. So wonder also um, builds ethics. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think we can do ethics anymore without ecological ethics. Or I think we have to never, we can't separate social and ecological ethics. I right. think it's, it's an earth community we're talking about. Exactly. Well, that question alone, we could go on for a long time about, but um, thank you so much for your perspectives on Teilhard, on Rachel Carson, Bachelard, Thomas Berry, um, and ending up with wonder. Uh, what a beautiful note. Heather, thank you so much, and we'll continue the conversation for sure. Thank you, Mary Evelyn. Great work. <laughs>